This is compared in the final tape on the New Order of Barbarians. This interview by Randy Engel, director of the U.S. Coalition for Life, with Dr. Larry Dunnigan, was taped on October 10, 1991, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, so I think, why don't we open up with a little bit about the man whom you are talking about on these tapes, uh, just a little profile and uh, a little bit about his education, and particularly his relationship with the uh, with the population control establishment. I think that probably was his his entree into much of this information. Yeah, uh, Dr. Day was the uh, chairman of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh from about 1959 through 64, about that period of time, and then. Uh, he left uh, the University of Pittsburgh and went to fill the position of medical director of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was about 1965 to 68, um, about that period? Yeah, that'd be about the time, 64, 65 to about 68 or 69. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he left there. Uh, I don't know specifically why I did not know him intimately. We were you know, more than acquainted. Uh, I was a student and he would seek lectures. And, uh, but, uh, and, and so he knew my name as a student and probably uh, corrected some of my test scores and, and that sort of thing. Of course, I knew him and his lecturer and would stand in front of the auditorium and would, you know, listen as he talked about diseases. And take so, out a students? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, take notes. Okay. So, it was interesting, this man um, is not as well known, I think, to our listeners, like na names like Mary Calderon, um, uh, Alan Guttmacher, they were both uh, medical directors at one time or other for Planned Parenthood. But uh, Dr. Day was not well known, and as a matter of fact, when I went back into the CEGIS archives, there was very, very little information that had his actual name on it. So he was not one of the better known of the medical directors, but I'd say he probably had the scoop on what was going on uh, as well, if not better, than any of the others before or after he came. Uh, what, what was he doing? Uh, I mean, can you describe the scene of this particular lecture, the approximate date, and what was the occasion, and then a little bit about the audience? That oh, yeah, this was the, uh, the Pittsburgh Pediatric Society holds about four meetings each year where we have some speaker come in and talk about a medical topic related to pediatrics. And um, this was our spring meeting. It's always late February or early part of March. This was in March of uh, 1969. And it was held at a restaurant uh, called Lamont, which is... Uh, well known in Pittsburgh. Yeah. A beautiful place. It looks the uh, confluence of the uh, Ohio, uh, where the Ohio River forms here with the conference of the Allegheny and the Mondial very, very, very pretty place in the, uh, in the tenants, I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 people. Mostly uh, physicians? Yeah, uh, mostly physicians, uh, if not exclusively physicians, predominantly pediatricians, but generally pediatric surgeons and pediatric radiologists, other people who were involved in medical care of children, even though they might uh, not be pediatricians as such. And the speech was given after a meal, I presume a That's very right. nice meal, and everyone was settled down and quite comfortable, quite comfortable and yeah. quite filled, and uh, really uh, an ideal state to absorb what was ever coming. I think that the, um, when you're listening to the tape, and he says some of the most, well, not only outrageous things, but also things that you would think uh, a pediatrician would kind of uh, almost jump off out of his seat up. For example, um, on the tapes when he mentioned the cancer cures. Mm -hmm. Now, there were probably doctors in the audience who had children perhaps with a, uh, uh, you know, treating a child or knowing of a child who was in need of a particular cancer cure. And to hear that they were sitting, some of these, uh, you know, prescriptions for or treatments for cancer were sitting over at the Rockefeller Institute and yet, as far as I got from the tape, everyone just kind of sat there, didn't say very much. I mean, he's talking about falsifying scientific data, and everyone just kind of yawns. And 
how long did the speech go on? Two hours. See, he spoke for uh, over two hours, which was longer than most of our speakers go. And uh, one of the interesting things, uh, as he finished and it was getting late, uh, uh, he said that there's much, much more, but we could be here all night, but it's time to stop. And I think that's significant, that there was much more that we never heard. Um, in the beginning of the presentation, I don't know whether I mentioned this on the, uh, at the introduction of the first tape or not, but somewhere in the beginning of this, he said, you will forget most or much of what I'm going to tell you tonight. And at the time, I thought, well, sure, that's true. We tend to forget. You know, somebody talks about it, you can forget a lot of what they say. But uh, uh, there is such a thing as the power of suggestion. And I can't say for sure, but I do wonder if this may not have been a suggestion when we were all full of a nice dinner and relaxed and listening. End of an evening. We took that suggestion and, and forgot because uh, I know a number of my colleagues who uh, who were there when I would uh, some years later say, do you remember when Dr. Day said this or he said that or he said the other? And they'd say, well, yeah, I, I, I kind of, is that what he said? You know, I kind of remember that. But um, uh, most were not very impressed, which to me was surprising because, uh, well, he used the uh, example of cancer cures, but he said a number of things that, uh, like doctors making too much money and yeah, you know, changing the image of the doctor, you're just going to be a high paid technician rather than a professional who exercises independent judgment yeah. on behalf of his independent patient. Mm -hmm. A number of things I thought that uh, should have been uh, offensive and elicited a reaction from uh, physicians because they are physicians. Mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised at how little reaction there was to it. And then other things that uh, I would have expected people to react to just because they were human beings. And uh, I think most of the people at the meeting uh, subscribe more or less to the Judeo-Christian ethic and codes of behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that was violated right and left. And uh, particularly one, uh, one of my friends who I thought would be as disturbed as I was about this just sort of smiled. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't disturbed at all. I thought, gee, this is surprising. I was part of it uh, also because of his prominence? I mean, he was... Uh, the, authority, the authority. The authority figure. Yeah, I think there may be something to there. This is the authority we uh, sort of uh, owe some deference here. I mean, he uh, couldn't possibly mean what he's saying, or there couldn't possibly be any... Me I mean, he's such a good guy. Uh, you know, I, I've often heard that phrase. Uh, mm -hmm. Gee, he's, he's such a good guy. I can't believe that he'd actually... Yeah, I, I, can, I, I can only speculate about this, but I, I do think at the time there was an element of disbelief about all of this, thinking, oh, this is uh, somebody's fairytale plan, but it will never really happen because it's too outlandish. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we know <laughs> step by step it is indeed happening right under our feet. Yeah. Um, before talking about the, uh, the, the specific areas, um, I think there's a lot of benefits from this tape. Um, one of them is when we have a good idea of what the opposition is about and the techniques he's using, then you can turn around and uh, begin your resistance to all the types of, of manipulation and so forth. So I think that the um, uh, one of the ways I'd like to start well here is uh, to talk about seeing that there were four or five uh, like theme songs that kept on he kept on repeating them um over and over again um for example um this business which i think is so important that people fail to distinguish uh between the ostensible reason and the real reason in other words um if you want someone to do something and you know that initially he'll um, be bulky at doing that because it's against his morals or against his religious beliefs. You have to substitute another reason that yes. will be acceptable. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then after he accepts it and it's a fait accompli, then you know there's just no no turning back. Right, right. And um, it was in that connection uh, that he said people don't ask the right questions. 
Yeah, but also too trusting. Too trusting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this was, as I recall, directed mostly at Americans. I had the feeling they thought Europeans maybe were, were uh, skeptical and more sophisticated. But Americans are too trusting uh -huh. and don't ask the right questions. Well, with regard to this um, kind of a lack of, almost a lack of uh, discernment, uh, I guess that he, that's basically what he was saying. They were easily tricked or uh, too trusting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the thing that really flashed through my mind rather quickly is, um, for example, in schools, how quickly uh, so-called AIDS education was introduced. And it did amaze me because um, if a, you know, if a group, um, stated publicly that they wanted to introduce the concept of sodomy or um, initiate uh, sex early and earlier in children uh, and that was the reason given uh, most parents uh, I presume wouldn't go for that so you have to come up with a, another reason and of course the reason um, uh, for this so-called AIDS education was to uh, uh, protect children from um, this disease, but actually, as it turns out, it's really been a, a great a boon for the homosexual network because through various things like Project 10, they now have access to our children from the youngest years. These programs are going on from K through 12, and I imagine into into well into college and, and beyond, so that they are reaching a, a, a tremendous um, segment. Uh, and speaking of children, I gathered that this speaker, uh, he, he kept on making a point about, um, well, old people, you know, they're going to go by the wayside. So I, I presume that the emphasis for these controllers or um, uh, this new world order is really an emphasis on youth. Would that be a Absolutely, yes. Emphasis on youth. This was stated explicitly. Um, people beyond a certain age, uh, they're set in their ways, and you're not going to change them. They have values, they're, they're going to stick to them. And, but you get to the youth when they're young, they're uh, pliable, you move them in the direction you want them to go. Um, so yeah, this is absolutely correct. They're, they're targeting the young, they figure uh, you old fellows that uh, don't see it our way, you're going to be dying off, or when the time comes, we're going to get rid of you. But uh, it's the youngsters we have to mold uh, in the uh, impression we want. Yeah, right. which is, is, is common sense. I think most totalitarians uh, have uh, uh, Now, there's that. something about the homosexuality to, I think, uh, to expand on. I don't think this came out on the original tape. But there was, first of all, we're going to promote homosexuality. And secondly, we recognize that it's bizarre, abnormal behavior. But this is another element in the law of the jungle. Because <clears throat> people are stupid enough to go along with this aren't fit to inhabit the planet, and they'll go by the wayside. Uh, I'm not stating this precisely the way he said it, but it wasn't too far from there where there was some mention of diseases being created. And when I remember the one statement and remember the other statement, uh, I believe that AIDS is a disease which has been created in the laboratory, and I think uh, one purpose that AIDS serves is to get rid of the people who are so stupid as to go along with our pro-homosexual program, let them wipe themselves out. Uh, now it's hard for me to make clear how much of this is I'm remembering with great confidence and how much is pure speculation. But as I synthesize this, uh, this is, I think, what happens. If you're dumb enough to be convinced by our promotion of homosexuality, you don't deserve a place, and you're going to fall by the wayside sooner or later to right. be rid of you. We'll select out the people who will survive are those who are also smart enough not to be deluded by our propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, does that make sense? Well, it uh, <laughs> it certainly makes sense for them, and uh, I think also this uh, early sex initiation has the overall purpose which I think we'll get to in depth a little later, but uh, of the sexualization of the population. Um, when he said on the tape, you know, basically uh, anything goes, I think that is, is um, what we're seeing. It's not so much that, um, let's say, someone may not adopt uh, the homosexual death style for himself, but as a result of the propaganda, he certainly will be a lot more tolerant of 
that type of behavior too. So that's it's a, it's a desensitization, even for the individual who doesn't go over and accept it for himself. With the power of propaganda, you dare not be against homosexuals, otherwise you'd be labeled homophobe. You dare not be against any of our program for women, otherwise you're a male chauvinist pig. Uh, you know, it's like anti-Semitism. Uh, it, this label gets enough um, currency in the culture that uh, uh, people get shot being stuck with it. Yeah. So it's easier to keep quiet. Well, another theme um, was this, this business about change, Kate. And I wanted to get to change in relationship to um, religion and family, but during the, when I, the period when I was hearing this tape, I remember going to a, um, a mass, and, and uh, they happened to have at that point um, uh, a dancing girls on the altar. And so when I was sitting and, and was getting a chance to listen to the tape, I thought, as, as a Catholic, that has been, you know, if you talk about the effective change, probably the most um, difficulty um, and, and the hardest thing has been to watch um, uh, our traditional mass um, that which Catholics have be, have practiced you know those things which they practiced and believed for so long and um, in about that time this tape or the speech was given which was about late 1969 everything had begun to turn over on its head so much so that um, I think many people feel that now when they go into a, a, um, uh, a church where there is the novice auto, you're almost in a, in a constant state of anxiety because you're not quite sure. What am I going to encounter? What are you going to encounter now? I mean, are we going to have you look at the, um, uh, the little um, uh, songbook? Of course, that's changed radically. And then you see instead of um, brethren, you see uh, people. Or you might see something odd happening up at the mat, you know, up at the uh, altar, which is now the table, and <laughs> so um, the notion of God as eternal and the teachings of Jesus Christ as eternal, and therefore the teachings of the Church as eternal, <clears throat> depends on the authority of God, uh, and God brings about change in God's way. Uh, what this boils down to me is these people say, no, we take the place of God. We establish what will change and what will not change. So if we say homosexuality or anything is moral today, wasn't yesterday, but it is today, we have said so, therefore it's moral. And we can change tomorrow. We can make it immoral again tomorrow. And this is uh, the usurpation of the role of God to define what the peons, what the ordinary person is supposed to believe. So the idea is that if everybody's used to change, most people aren't going to ask, well, who has decided what should be changed and how it should be changed? Most people just go along with it, like uh, hemlines and uh, shoe styles and that sort of thing. Uh, so it is a, a, a usurpation of the role of God. And if you read the Humanist Manifesto, uh, in a summer early in, in the uh, introductory part of it, they say human intellect is the highest good. Well, to any human being, what you call the highest good, that's your God. So to these people, human intellect being the highest good is God. And where does human intellect reside? Well, in the brain of one or more human beings. So these people, in effect, I don't think they would be so a uh, candidate has to say so, but uh, whether they know it or not, what they're saying is, I am God, we are God, because we decide what is moral today, what is moral tomorrow, what's going to be moral next year. We determine change. That's right. And of course, in a nutshell, you just explained the uh, human potential, new age, or all the uh, new uh, esoteric uh, movements that we've seen. Uh, but. In, with regard to, to change, um, he seemed to acknowledge that there were a couple of, of um, entities which traditionally blocked this, um, this change and therefore made people resistant to uh, constant manipulation. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of those uh, is the family. 
yes. and that would include uh, uh, the family, grandmothers, grandfathers, or ethnic background, and so forth. And I guess I was impressed by everything he seemed to mention, whether it was um, economics, whether it was uh, music, had the, the overall effect of diminishing the family and yep. enhancing the power of the state. Right. Yeah. That was just right. a constant, a constant theme. And therefore, when we're evaluating things, I think one of the things we should generally uh, say to ourselves is, what effect does that have on, on family oh, life yeah, yeah. and the yeah. family? And uh, I think if every congressman or senator asked that question, we probably wouldn't have. Um, um, much action up on, on Capitol Hill because almost everything coming down the pike um, has uh, a, uh, uh, a fact of you know uh, disavowing, hurting the family life, and enhancing the and expanding the power of government. It has an ostensible purpose, <laughs> <laughs> and then it has a real purpose. Yeah, and as a as a so-called helping professional, uh, <laughs> your ability to say that is is, uh, is really interesting. Uh, uh, on that, the other, of course, uh, factor um, is this whole factor of religion. And um, he was talking about a basically a religion without dogma, a religion that would have a little bit. Uh, from all the other traditional religions, so no one would really feel uncomfortable. Um, but and, and and actually, you know, as he said rather condescendingly, every, you know, that some people need this, and if they need it, well, we'll manufacture right. something that they need. Um, but of course, it, it can't be um, anything that would uh, declare anything that they were moral absolutes or the natural law, which mean that the main target of the this um, group of controllers. Uh, of course, was and is the Roman Catholic Church, yep. and he mentioned the Roman Catholic Church specifically. Religion is important because <clears throat> it is eternal, and we people who would follow the Church will not buy our own rules about change. But if we make our own religion, we define what is religion, then we can change it as it suits us. Uh, Yes, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I was kind of flattered sitting there as a Catholic, uh, <laughs> hearing, hearing it pointed out that uh, the Church is the one obstacle that um, he said we have to change that. And once the Roman Catholic Church falls, the rest of Christianity will fall. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed, though, that uh, as the conversation went on, he said, now, you may think churches will stand in your way, but I would just want to tell you that they will help oh, us. Yes. And he didn't say they will help us all accept the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> he said no, they will help us. Yes. And unfortunately, he was right. He didn't say this explicitly, but again, uh, was one of those things that the themes that came through. He really thought the use of words was real important because he mentioned this with regard to a number of things like the Bible, um, yes. how. Uh, you know, the uh, very famous um, psychiatrist um, Miru mentioned that uh, if you want to control people, then you control the language first, and uh, words are weapons. Uh, he apparently knew that very well, and I, I think the uh, controllers as a whole know this very well, and very of course well. it's part of their their uh, campaign. Um, but that, that little statement about, uh, about words that Words will be changed. Uh, when I heard that, I thought, you know, uh, instead of saying altar, you say table. Instead of saying sacrifice, you say kneel. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the um, uh, to the mass, and uh, people say, well, that's not important. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course, is. Is. of course, what you end up with, of course, is you, you really know that that's very important. Otherwise, why would they bother to change it? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, why go through all this rigmarole of uh, if it wasn't important? It's obviously important for them because they know with the changing the words, you change they're ideas. They're exerting a lot of effort and time to change it, and they're not exerting their effort on things that are unimportant. So, yes, you're absolutely right. The priest is the presider. He no longer has the role. In some cases, he no longer has the moment to perform it. Yes, those words are 
because words carry meaning. There's the, uh, the, the dictionary definition, but uh, I think we all know certain words carry meaning that, that uh, uh, is a little bit hard to put into words, but they carry meaning. So yes, that's uh, controlling the language. You, know, you think in your language, you think yourself in English or Spanish or whatever, languages you're familiar with, but when you think you talk to yourself, and you talk to yourself in words, just the way you talk to other people. That's right. And uh, if you can, you control the language with which one person speaks to himself or one person speaks to another, you've gone a long way toward controlling what that person is able, what he's capable of thinking. And uh, that has both an inclusionary and an exclusionary component to it. Uh, you set the tone with... Take the word gay, for example. Take the word gay. That's a, uh, a good one. I have some old tapes by Fonz uh, Lehar, and then he talks about the gay hussars, you know, the the happy um, soldiers, and uh, now you couldn't quite use that same word. Could but you not. <laughs> get, get away with it? <laughs> so may take offense and with injury. <laughs> But uh, again, the, you know, the, the word homosexual, um, sodomite, has been replaced with the term gay. It represents an ideology, not only a word, and when you use it, you're, it's, it's tacit to ex saying, yes, I, I accept what your interpretation of this is. And they probably had a committee working for months to pick out which word they were going to use. And gay carries a connotation which, first of all, is inaccurate. Most homosexuals are not at all gay. They're, they tend to be pretty unhappy people. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, despite all the publicity telling them that they can and should feel comfortable what they're doing, most of them deep down inside don't accept they have a conscience which says otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And homophobia and other things. Ah, uh, yes, but one can hardly wait. Uh, I suppose they're going to come up with a, a, a sadophobia for those who have a hang up with a sadomasochism, and they'll have a pedopho uh, you know, pedophobia for those who have difficulties with uh, being a pedophile. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we can just look forward to uh, this type of thing. I guess we can look forward to them to the extent that we permit ourselves to permit the opposition to have access to the brain. And to dictate the terms we use, sex education is not education. That's right. It's, it's uh, conditioning, and we should never use the term sex education. It's a misnomer. They, if they control the vocabulary, then they control the way we can think and the way we can express ideas among ourselves and to anybody. But uh, sex conditioning, uh, sex, sex initiation. initiation is much more accurate, and we should insist on that. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a, uh, we should never use terms homophobia and gay. Right. Homosexual is homosexual. It's not at all gay. That's right. Um, In fact, we're going to have to probably do some homework. Um, I know uh, probably all the popular movements in the United States, probably I said the pro-life movement is probably the most sensitive to words. Um, I remember that when um, I was sitting down and listening, uh, 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 talking about uh, the you know uh, media events and access to the brain. I remember that the first speech that uh, Bush gave, in which he talked about the new world order, and uh, I remember jumping halfway off my seat. <laughs> the term that here he is, the president, do you say new world order as if it was uh, you know something everyone knew about and. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, someone looking across the room, so I, you know, so well, what do you, I heard that, what, what, what did he say, what did he say? He said, he said, well, he said New World Order, and, well, what does that mean, you know, why is that extraordinary? Or, but anyway, this, so one of the things, I think, one of the weapons that we have against the, the um, controllers is the knowledge that we can, if we can cut off his access to our mind, then, um, then we have a, a shot at um, at uh, escaping being manipulated, if not totally, at least a, 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 escape a, a good portion of the um, of the manipulation. Do you remember one of the books on um, Chinese POWs pointed out that uh, some of the survivors, in order to uh, uh, to not be brainwashed, broke their eardrums. And in that way, they were unable to hear 
and being unable to hear, the enemy could not have access to their brain, and therefore um, they were able to survive where others did not. Yes. And uh, in our popular culture here, we have a number of, uh, of things that TV and radio probably primarily that uh, uh, are the constant uh, uh, means by which the opposition has access to our brain and to our children's brain. So I think one of the logical uh, conclusions and one of the very common sense conclusions is if you don't want the enemy to have access, you have to cut off <laughs> cut off the uh, lines of access, which would be in in, um, <coughs> uh, in homes is simply to um, either eliminate altogether or uh, control by uh, other forms. Uh, Take the networks out the way. They say, you don't want to watch our programming? Turn it off. And we should. We should say, here, yeah, you're right. And turn it off. And let the advertisers spend your money on, on an audience that isn't there. Right? Uh, but uh, as a pediatrician, I'm always interested in how kids do things and how kids uh, are, are like adults. <clears throat> and what you're talking about, international politics where one nation goes to war against another, or kids on the playground. There are certain things that are common. It's just that the kids on the playground do it on a smaller scale. <clears throat> But you mentioned cutting off access to to your brain. Somebody says, "I don't want to hear it." And uh, I remember kids on the playground. I'm sure we've all seen this. Somebody saying, "Yeah, yeah, Jimmy did it," and they're teasing a the kid. What's he do? He puts his hands over his ears. He said, "I'm not going to listen." <laughs> <laughs> and the kid wants to torment him. We'll try to pull his hands away and be sure that he listens. And it's a scary. Words, words entering in the child knows. Words have meaning, they're hurting him. Girl Girls know it, Lennon knew it, <laughs> CBS knows it. Uh, it's, it's just interesting. It's, the principles stands across the board, it just gets more complicated as you get older, more sophisticated. But whereas kids on a playground, you'll learn a whole lot about adults <laughs> in the world. I had to just sort of slip that in. Yeah, I think um, most of us are shaking our heads uh, at that one. Um, this uh, Dr. Day was very much into the whole population control um, uh, establishment, and uh, he was, of course, uh, in, in favor of abortion. But as he again started talking about um, the aged and euthanasia, I recall uh, one of the books, a uh, population control book, saying that uh, birth control without death control was meaningless. And one of the, uh, if we can use the expression, um, one of the advantages in, in term is if, if one was favorable toward uh, the killing of the aged, uh, one of the favorable things is in fact abortion for the simple reason is that universally speaking, abortion has the result of bringing about a rather inordinate chopping off of population at the front end, that is at, at the birth end. Yes. And the inevitable effect is that you will have a population which is top heavy mm -hmm. with an, a rapidly aging population, which is the current state in the United States. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, <clears throat> if you are going to go about killing the young, especially at the pace uh, we seem to have adopted ourselves to in this country, then invariably um, you're going to have to do something about all those aging populations because the few children who are born, uh, after all, they cannot be expected to carry this tremendous burden of all these these people. So you're cutting one end right. and uh, therefore inevitably, um, as you pointed out on the tape, he was saying, well, th these few young people who were permitted to be born will really feel this inevitable burden on them and so they'll be more uh, sensitized, desensitized, they'll be more warmed up to the idea of, uh, of grandma and grandpa having this little party and then um, uh, shuffling off to the, you know, the uh, wherever they shuffle off to and uh, whether it's taking the demise pill or uh, going to a, you know, a death camp. Or there was a movie out some years back called Soylent Green. Ah, yes. Do you remember Soylent? Yes, I remember it very distinctly. And Charles Heston was the... I only saw parts of the movie. I never saw the whole thing from beginning to end. But Edward G. Robinson went to sit in the theater and he listened to Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. That's right. As he was to take his demise pill. That's right.
we also made the point that, of course, the food that the people were eating were each other. Uh, eat each other. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, there's, uh, yeah, but that's, uh, as you said, uh, as long as it's done with dignity right. and, uh, and humanely, um, like, uh, you know, putting away your horse, which is... <laughs> It's a little bit like uh, pornography. Years back, uh, when kids would come across pornography, it was always poor photography and cheap paper. And Playboy came out with the glossy pages and it was really good photography. So then pornography, uh, you know, it's no longer cheap, it's respectable. We went to uh, a movie at the Pittsburgh Playhouse. Uh, I took my son along. Uh, it was a well, the movie was the uh, Manchurian Candidate. But the, uh, the thing... Uh, I remember the movie. Do you remember yes, the Yes, I do. <laughs> well, <clears throat> during the preview set of other things that were going to come, it was a movie whose title I don't remember, but it was uh, well photographed in technicolor with classical music in the background, and it was a pornographic movie. And uh, I remember saying, well, if you have a guitar, then it's pornography. If you have classical music, that converts it into art. <laughs> that was pornography. <laughs> so, what, you know, just uh, another example of uh, uh, an <clears throat> example of what you were saying. As long as it's done with dignity, that's what counts. So, if you kill somebody with dignity, it's okay. If you have pornography with dignity, with classical music, <laughs> then it's art. Right. Yeah. That, that was the point I was trying to. <laughs> The, um, well, there were, um, again, talking about uh, the family, um, currently I know an awful lot of people who are um, out of jobs, and he had quite a bit to say about uh, certain things like, uh, for example, heavy industry, um, and uh, things like that. I, I guess what was the, the shock was that this man, I mean, I wasn't surprised that he knew a lot about uh, population control, uh, abortion, of the other end, euthanasia. But what did surprise me was that he was an individual who was talking about um, religion, law, education, um, uh, sports, entertainment, uh, food. Uh, how could one individual, and I think this is probably the question that everyone listening to these tapes is asking, how could a individual have that much input. Now, one could say, well, um, you know, it didn't pan out, but we know, listening to the, these recollections 20 years later, I can't really, except perhaps for um, um, maybe some minor things, everything that he has said has truly come to pass and, and, and almost beyond, uh, uh, you know, beyond uh, the imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, how could one individual uh, talk with such a, uh, uh, you know, authoritative, uh, non-questioning thing that this is the way this was going to happen, and this was going to happen in fashion, and this is what we were going to see on TV, and there were going to be, you know, uh, uh, video uh, recorders before I even ever heard of the word. Uh, I, I think what happens is certainly one individual hears this, but the plans are by no means made by one or a small number of individuals. Just as industrial corporations, they'll have a board of directors with people from all sorts of activities. They sit on the board of this corporation and they say, now if we do this to our product or we expand in this area, what will that do to banking? What will that do to clothing? What will that do? What impact uh, will that have on other things? And I'm sure that uh, whoever makes these plans, they have uh, representatives uh, from. Uh, you know, every area you can think of. So they'll have educators, they'll have uh, clothing manufacturers, designers, uh, architects. Uh, uh, every aspect of every human yeah. endeavor? Or yeah, across right. the board. And then when they, I'm sure they get together uh, and, and have meetings and plan and everybody puts in his input, just, you know, the way military operation does. Mm -hmm. What will the Navy do? Will they bombard the shore? What will the Air Force do? Will they come in with air cover? What will the infantry do? It's, it's the same thing. These people, when they plan, they don't miss a trick. They, uh, they have uh, experts in every field. They say, now, if we do this, that, and the other, 
John, what will that do to your operation? And he said, and he'll be in a, John will be in a position to feedback, well, here's what I think would happen. So, uh, it's uh, it certainly covers a broad range of uh, people, and for one individual to be able to say all of this in the two eyes that he spoke to us uh, really uh, tells us that he was privy to a lot of information. And that's right. He must have been sitting in one of those boardrooms at least some point, and uh, I think perhaps not at the highest level from, from his position, but uh, enough because um, anyone in the population control movement would be associated with veins of, of um, foundations, powerful foundations, powerful um, organizations, and... Um, and I'm okay. sure that there's a lot that uh, was in the plans that he never heard of. I mean, he wasn't uh, a four-star general in this audience. So That's he right. Wouldn't, he wouldn't be, uh, you know, on the whole story. He was well, it's too bad he couldn't have talked for six hours instead of two. Uh, we might have had a lot more <laughs> information. Um, there was a, another aspect that uh, I found fascinating in, in listening to this. Um, this this whole aspect of um, of of privacy. Um, he mentioned that um, oh, as as the uh, you know as the private homes went by, we would have individuals. Uh, non-family members perhaps uh, you know sharing our uh, apartments as i understand is is uh, becoming more popular out in, in california um oh. of course california and new york being the borders the uh, what the coast states were they and yeah, yeah. therefore the quiet the port that's right port cities port cities that that bring in things so that they can eventually work their way to middle america and uh but this, this business about privacy um when he was talking about, um, about, for example, the area of, of sex, he made some speaking uh, Who is open knowledge? Yeah. But the players won't be that open about their own lives. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, reserve, they'll reserve their privacy. It's for the rest of us. Yes, yeah, just like um, they're uh, listening to uh, uh, concerts and operas, and but for the mass media, they're pumping in the hard rock yeah. and um, uh, all those types of things. That was another um, fascinating thing. For example, the uh, and and I know this has come to pass because uh, I deal with a lot of young people. But young people have their own uh, radio stations for their music, mm -hmm. and adults have their own, and never the twain shall meet. Right. And when they do, there's usually a clash right. <laughs> between the old generation and the younger. <laughs> and I think the same is probably true with uh, a lot of the, the classical movies and. Uh, uh, and and again, uh, I I can't remember when I was growing up, and my dad had the radio on. I can't be. I think the music was kind of a general music that yeah. you know there wasn't. My, I didn't say to my dad, Dad, I don't like that music. Turn on to another station. Whereas now um, there is a, a a fabricated generational gap, uh, which again um, puts the family at at, at the uh, the disadvantage and. Uh, and it creates conflict in the family, which is one of the spin-off benefits to them. Uh, if you're constantly fussing at your kids, you don't like what they're playing, and they're focusing on you, they don't like what you're playing, that does give things to the bonds of affection that you would like to be nurturing them to. So they're, yeah. Yeah. And uh, speaking of family, again, um, one of the things, then, it would appear um, for any resistance movement for the population controllers would probably be based on families um, strengthening themselves in, in, in a number of ways, um, one of them being uh, to um, make sure that children know about grandma and grandpa and where did they come from and developing a whole, um, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, getting out the family albums and making sure that children know they have roots first of all, and secondly, uh, that the, their family is is stable. One father, one mother, with children, with grandfathers, and so forth. Better uh, harder and harder to find. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, those of us who have them should hold on to them. And so, toward the end of the tape, um, there was a, a reference to how, or, or at the time when everything would be coming together, 
how this new world order uh, would be introduced um, to a, uh, a population which at this point I think they would have assumed would have been uh, more than acceptable to it. How How is this put? I mean, um, we're just going to wake up one morning and, and, and changes will be there or how, what did he think about that? Right. <coughs> it, it was presented in what must be an oversimplified fashion. Uh, so with some qualifications, here's the recollection I have of it. Uh, in the winter, and there was importance to the winter, uh, on a weekend, like on a, a Friday, an announcement would be made that, uh, that this was in place, or about to be in place. Yeah. That the order, that the, the new, new order. The new world order was now the system for the world. Mm -hmm. And we all owe this new world order our allegiance. Our allegiance. And the reason for winter is that, um, and this was stated, people less prone to travel in winter, particularly if they live in an area where there's ice and snow. Summer is easier to get up and go. And the reason for weekend is, um, People who would have questions about this, Saturday and Sunday everything's closed and they would not have an opportunity to raise questions and file a protest and say, no, no, no. Uh, and just that period of the weekend would allow a desensitizing period so that when Monday came and people were, had an opportunity maybe to uh, express some reservation about it or even to oppose it. They would have 48 hours to absorb the idea and get used to it. Cooling off period, down. Right. Or, or a heating up period, depending on what <laughs> frame of mind. <laughs> what about uh, those who decided they didn't want to go along? Um, somewhere in there, it was that because this is a new authority, and it represents a change then from where your allegiance was presumed to be, people would be called upon to publicly acknowledge their allegiance to this new authority. And, uh, this would mean that uh, you had to sign an agreement or, or in some public way uh, acknowledge that you accepted this, uh, you offered your allegiance to this new authority, you accepted its legitimacy. And uh, there were two impressions I carried away if you didn't. I'm not sure whether the two impressions are necessarily mutually exclusive because uh, this wasn't explored in great detail. Um, one of them was that uh, you would simply have nowhere to go. If you don't sign up, then you can't get any electric impulses in your banking account, and you won't have any electric impulses with which to pay your rent or your mortgage or your food. You know, when your electric impulses or gone, then you have no means of livelihood. Um, Could you get these things from other people? Or would that be, well, in other words, let's say if you had a sympathetic family, I mean, what? But, uh, <laughs> no, you could not because the housing authority would keep close tabs on who was, in, who was inhabiting um, any domicile, <laughs> any house, any apartment, uh -huh. any condominium. And uh, so the housing authority would be sure that people, everybody who lived there was authorized to live there. Uh, Did I get some food? And food, uh, your expenditures uh, through electronic surveillance would be uh, pretty tightly watched so that if you were spending too much money at the supermarket, uh, somebody would pick us up and say, how come? What are you doing all that food? You don't want that food. Up. You don't have that many people. We know you're not entertaining. What are you doing with all that food? And these things then would alert the... I have seven people in my basement who object to this new world order and I'm mm -hmm. feeding them and then they said, well, one has to go. Uh -huh. they, don't, they don't belong here and you can't feed them and uh, since you're sympathetic to them, maybe your allegiance isn't very trustworthy either. So. Well, yeah, we see this really, uh, I think the, the Chinese experience is tells us a great deal about um, about certain things. For example, when they wanted to enforce the one child family, what did they do? Well, of course, they cut off all education for the second child. 
uh, you your food rations were cut so that you couldn't get uh, you know a pregnant woman couldn't get the right, uh, right. amount of food, and ultimately uh, still if they found ways around that then they they um, uh, instituted a compulsory abortion and uh, the compulsory plugging in of the IUDs and and all this and uh, you yes. know when when we would somewhere in the tape this business about uh, people can carry two conflicting ideas around or even espouse two two conflicting ideas around as long as they don't get real close together yeah. and what immediately came to mind was here we have an organization like Planned Parenthood freedom to choose freedom to choose yet they support population control programs which is of course not the freedom to choose yeah. not the freedom to choose yeah. And no one ever calls them to account and says, now, wait a minute now, you're freedom to choose here, but you're supporting the Chinese program, which is compulsory. And uh, I remember a statement from the uh, late Alan Guttmacher, one of the uh, medical directors of Planned Parenthood, and he said, well, uh, you know, if, if uh, people um, uh, limit their families and, and do basically what we say, we'll fine. But if we need compulsory population control, we're going to have it. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I'm just... Uh, I, I'm, I was just curious as to what would happen um, with uh, with people who wouldn't go along, and particularly that point about um, it wouldn't be any martyrs, and that was significant because I, I can recall um, having watched some movies about the Third Reich that many times they would come late in the evening and people would be taken from their homes. But neighbors would never then ask, where did they go? Mm -hmm. was, they knew where they went. So what it is that Melissa mentioned that in the Blue Lake Archipelago. Does he? Yeah. Uh, and I, I think this is, is, is very similar to what we, we would see. People would just disappear, and you would not ask because it might endanger yourself right. or your family. Yeah. But you would know where they went. If you ask questions, you draw attention to yourself, and then you might follow them to where they went. That's so right. Mind your own business and step over the starving man on the street who didn't go along. Uh, yeah, he didn't go into detail about, uh, you know, precisely how this would come about, but it's not too hard to, uh, to imagine. Uh, yeah, uh, in the past, the Nazis came, the communists came in the middle of the night, and, and people just disappeared. And uh, uh, one simple way to do this is if you're cut off from all uh, economic support, uh, so you have no place to live and nowhere to eat. Uh, we already see a lot of us now. Uh, I just heard a man in the office this morning talking about uh, he and his child seeing people living in boxes uh, downtown Pittsburgh today. Today. It's the homeless guys living in boxes. Well, when the New World Order is here and you're living in a box, and we can't have people literally watering and just... <laughs> trash. Yeah. So you come around with the wagon and you pick them up. Frame of mind as you're growing up in form is that human value resides in being productive. You have to uh, have a prestigious position or at least perform something useful. Make a contribution. And the truck comes by to pick up some guy who's living in a box and he's not making any contribution. Who's going to get excited about it? He's, you know, he's subhuman. He's a fetus. He's a yeah. zygote. He's a. He's a derelict. Uh, fetuses and zygotes and derelicts okay. all are the same animal. So, what do you do? Just follow that. Who gets excited about it? You mentioned animal. Um, I recall that when uh, the Chinese communists came into power, one of the first things that they taught in the schools was not any, any um, thoughts about, uh, you know, specific political ideology, but evolution, that, that man was just an animal. Mm -hmm. And if man is just an animal, then we won't mind being herds and having masters who keep tabs on the animals. And uh, we're one big ant colony, and we've got someone to direct traffic. And uh, oh, and speaking of traffic, uh, getting back to uh, we talk about the the agent, and uh, again, people hearing this tape are it, it, it's phenomenal how many times this is the thing. Hit, the things on this tape will hit you. Um, I just came back from New Jersey, which has a lot of uh, retirement-type villages. And uh, I, I've been there um, over a period of years, and there's a structure around a retirement home which has been uncompleted. For, it has to at least be two or three years. Now, they've recently completed it. It's kind of a, a roadway. 
but I think it, it would be easier to get out of a, um, a complex at a, at a, a, a playland. It is so complicated, and yet the, the whole region has elderly people driving, and here, here we are, you know, a fairly <laughs> middle-aged couple, and, and for the life of us, we couldn't figure out how we were going to get out, what we were going to do, and so I asked some of the residents, I said, doesn't it bother you that they haven't fixed this road for years, and now they're, they're coming up, and the spring is so complex, you just can't go across the street, which would have been the logical thing. You have to go down, and they have a jug handle, and, and you have to go over and under, so it takes you so long. And the woman replied to me, well, you know, we just don't go out. <laughs> we just don't go out. So here we are, this little retirement village where they have made it very difficult for a population. Maybe there's, a, uh, you know, 40 or 50, maybe, well, actually probably more than that, several hundred homes in this plat with only one exit. And the exit involves such a great deal of, of, of bother that they said, well, you know, we, we try to just cut down on the, the numbers or the the, uh, the times we have to go out shopping. Right away, it makes and, me wonder if, if it's difficult to get out. It's also difficult to get in, probably, for visitors. These retirement homes kind of remind me of, uh, like, a elephant burial ground. You know what I mean? <laughs> but there's no, uh, the one thing you notice is there's no children. There's not the laughter of children in these homes. My experience has been that people in like retirement homes or nursing homes, when they see a child, they just blossom. They're really delighted to see a child. Sure, they're happy to have their sons and daughters come, other adults, but when they see a child, it doesn't even have to be their own. It just has a, uh, a very beneficial uh, effect on their mood. And if these older people aren't seeing children, the other side of that coin is the children are not seeing older people either. <laughs> That's right. So if you don't get used to seeing older people, they don't exist. That's right. And, uh, I think is another interesting angle on what you Yeah, said and that's why, again, with the uh, with the family, making sure your children see their grandparents very often, no matter you know what how much that uh, tail the trouble is is uh, of the logistics is certainly worthwhile, um, because uh, again, if if you never see someone and you don't learn to love them and you have no contact with them, when someone says, well, it's time for your grandpa to check out, well, who's that? Who's, who's going to defend and, and fight for someone that they never even saw before? Talk, oh, I remember one of the phrases. Um, this is, again, so many of these things. You only have to hear them once, and they, they stick in your mind. Yes. They're, they're so <laughs> jarring. Yeah. Was this, that we've already discussed um, sex without reproduction. Mm -hmm. Then he also said the technology would be there for reproduction without sex. Right. And this seems to me this is a whole this is a whole nother area because one of the uh, you know with um, again uh, uh, contradictory things occurring because you would think well if if a, if a land is over so called overpopulated then you would want to diminish sexual activity, or, you know, you'd want to get rid of pornography, you want to get everything that was sexually stimulating. But no, it, it's just the contrary. You want to increase sexual activity, but only insofar as it doesn't lead to reproduction. Right, right. That was the message, right? Yeah, you know, that leads, and this is my own extension, he didn't say that, but that leads to slavery because if you become enslaved to your gratification, whether it's sex food or whatever, then you're more easily controlled, which is one of the uh, reasons uh, the celibate priesthood is so important, and so many priests don't even understand that. But um, if you're addicted to sex, uh, well, you know, if sex is just divorced from reproduction, sex is something that you do for gratification only. Um, I won't try to parallel with food because you, you can't go without food. Uh, then you're, you can be more easily controlled by the availability or the removal of the availability of stuff. Um, so that can become a, an enslaving feature. Now, uh, reproduction without sex, um, what you would get then is a product which has all the desirable attributes of a human being without any claim to human rights. 
the way we do it now, you say, well, you're human because you have a father and a mother and you have a grandfather and uncle Fred and a family, so you're a human being, you have human rights. But if your father was a petri dish and your mother was a dust tube, uh, how can you lay claim to human rights? So Not you, too much warfare, is there? You owe your existence to the laboratory, which uh, conveys to you no human rights. And there's no God, so you can't go for any God-given human rights. So you're an ideal slave. You have all the attributes of a human being, but you don't have to any claim on rights. Mm -hmm. Well, in, uh, in Brave New World, if you remember, they had this the caste system, you know, the alphas, the omegas, and so forth. Yeah. And the lowest caste, well, the way they um, des they brought about the different caste systems in was that in the uh, decanting room or the birthing room, uh, the individual who was to be, let's say, um, to do menial labor or slave labor work in the mines, they received just a little bit of oxygen to the brain so that they learned to love their slavery and they were very happy because they didn't know any better. They didn't have the, uh, the, the, the brains or the wherewithal to, uh, uh, to do things. But of course, the higher in the caste you got, uh, the more oxygen was uh, you know, given to your, your brain. So we actually had a group of, of sub-human beings mm -hmm. um, you know, who would um, be at the, um, as you say, a slave, essentially. And, uh, but they would love their slavery. Mm -hmm. See, in the past, slaves probably haven't loved their slavery very much. Yeah. But in this case, uh, we have this technology which will make people love their slavery. And each cast loved being what they were in Brave New World. Yeah. And any of our listeners who hasn't read that recently, I think you read it recently again, didn't you? Yeah. Or read it for the first time? Yeah, I read it for it's the phenomenal, first time. isn't it? Yeah. The, and, uh, I, I don't remember. Uh, you may remember the wording of the slogan that was about the Nazi concentration camps. Uh, something about work is peace and work is happiness. Uh, I don't remember whether it was Buchenwald or Auschwitz or one of them that had this sign about it. Mm -hmm. uh, your, my recollection of the words is imprecise, but the idea is what counts. And here's Huxley writing Brave New World saying basically the same thing before Hitler even uh, was in power. Oh, yeah. So Huxley uh, knew <laughs> something, didn't he? Yeah, well, of course, he came from a family that probably uh, um, contributed at least in part to this, this New World Order. Uh, uh, a number of the English authors, H.G. Wells, has a, has a, there are a number of books um, uh, from that period, and I think also from the, uh, the, uh, those associations, who highlighted uh, uh, at least concepts of you know what was coming down the uh, down the path, mm -hmm. and um, when we reading, um, I read uh, Brave New World when I was in like high school. And reading it uh, thirty years later, I can remember reading it in high school. I thought, boy, is this fantasy land? <laughs> reading it thirty years later, and I said, this is scary. This is reality. It's too this close is to <laughs> Yeah, and I and then after I thought about it, I wasn't sure whether. Huxley wrote it, you know, it, there seems to be some type of, of, of the similar thinking between uh, his, his writings and then the, 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 this talk given by uh, Dr. Day, because you get a, a kind of a mix, mixed message in Brave New World that these things are not really quite good. It would be better if man still had a sense of humor, if he still had a sense of privacy, if, if um, you know, uh, certain things, the family still existed. But... It's, an, it's inevitable. They're, they're going to go, too bad, you know, I feel a little sorry about that, a little sentiment, but um, the, the new order has to come in, and, and we're going to have to make room for it. And, uh, and I got that same impression from the things that have been said about this, this day take. There seemed to be a, you know, he wasn't real happy about some of the things, but then, you know, they're going to occur anyway, and, and you know, make it easier on yourself, the easier you, you know, more... To accept it's easier it's going to be for everyone around and i'm kind of doing you a favor That's you good. physicians out there this evening i'm going to make it easier for you by telling you in advance what's coming and you can make your own adjustments Is that somewhere in scripture uh, i think it's after the flood uh, god said i will write my law on men's hearts and uh, i i feel the same parallel that, that you drew between uh, dr today's reaction to what he was exposed to and mine. Seeming not totally accepting of this, 
and actually seeming not totally accepting of what he really does, but both saying, well, there's a certain inevitability to all of this, and so, uh, you know, let's try to talk about the best part of it. It's going to be good for people. Technology will be better. Quality of life will be better. So you live a few years shorter. Uh, uh, but they, uh, they both do seem to send out messages of what? Buying the whole package. And I think... And maybe wishing some people would ask more questions. You yeah. know, this, this business. Well, you know, many... You know, looking looking back over history, there there are many leaders or um, individuals who thought, well, you know, they had a they had an idea of, of what a new world order should be. Uh, certainly, Hitler did. Uh, um, but what was lacking during these periods is that they lacked lacked the really the technology to carry many of many of the things out: surveillance, um, constant monitoring. Uh, but in the in the so-called new world order, it's going to be very difficult to escape because technology will provide those means which had been lacking those uh, totalitarian-minded individuals from years ago. I right? I can't remember on the original tapes did I mention the phrase where he said, "This time we're going to do it right." No, he didn't. Oh, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> there's, there's, there's so many details to get in, but that's. <laughs> When, when he mentioned bringing in the New World Order, he said, this time we're going to do it right. And right away I'm wondering. We mean well, this time? <laughs> we mean this time. Well, we're Have we done it time. before? What? And uh, uh, this was, there's no explicit explanation of that, but I think it's fairly easy to infer that the previous efforts had to do with the Third Reich and, and communism. And, uh, Everything going back to the French Revolution, I would say. So, and... and your point about the technology you know, is is critical uh, with computers and all means of exchange being controlled by electronic impulses. Nobody has any wealth. You owe nothing of value except access to electronic impulses, which are beyond your own control. Um, a cashless society? A cashless society. So when your reward for working is uh, so many impulses on the, uh, on the computer, and then you go to the checkout or the furniture store or the clothing store and you buy and you, uh, in exchange, you give so many electronic impulses. So, uh, the only claim you have is to these impulses. And you know, the people that run the system can be ever taken those to choose. Up until this time, there was no way this statement in the book of Revelation that said, no man can buy or sell unless he has a market of vision. There's no way that could be important. People can say, hey, I'll trade a bushel of tomatoes for a bushel of wheat. If you ride my kids to school, I'll give you six ears of corn. Mm -hmm. or, uh, bartering. bartering, right. Uh, and even not going necessarily to other I mean, there's always gold and silver and other forms of money that were even better than bartering. But with this cashless society, this is the first time, I believe, in the history of the human race where the entire population of the world can be controlled economically so that somebody can say, I know I'm pushing the right buttons, I know how much credit you have electronically, I know where you spend your money electronically, and you cannot buy, you cannot sell unless you get on my computer. Uh, right now you have a half a dozen credit cards in your pocket, but pretty soon they'll be narrowed into one credit card. And then one week, you know, ostensible reason is people lose their credit cards, and we have to get rid of that and put the implant in. That's right. <laughs> and and the uh, is, where can you put the implant in, on your hand or on your forehead? Where it has to be accessible to the skin. So yeah. your right hand or your forehead. Speaking of scanner, um, when the uh, we had the, the TV war, the Gulf War, mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, the first war, you just sit there and 24 hours a day, just, just like being on the battlefield there. But there was uh, several points made about the advances in technology um, and how they could spot just one little individual down in, in you know, uh, I mean, they could pin, they used the constant reference to pinpoint, pinpoint, pinpoint. pinpoint. Well, I imagine that with these, um, the, 
the different uh, technologies. They could also pinpoint a couple of renegades in the New World Order. I mean, oh, yeah. that what was the technology was which was applicable to a so-called enemy can also be applicable to this controlling the order. You know, with. exactly. You know, um, it, it's infrared stuff that is uh, I'm sort of amateurish about this, but any heat source like a, a deer or a human being, a renegade. Uh, um, can be picked up by an infrared scanner, and you get sort of an outline of whether it's a deer or a sheep or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, these, my first hearing about them was uh, in the Vietnam War, where our troops used them to detect the enemy. Now that's what uh, 20 some years ago. So they're probably even more sophisticated now than they were then. But uh, with this kind of uh, surveillance, it'd uh, be pretty hard for anybody to escape and say, "Well, I'm just going to." go off into the mountains and be a hermit and escape the New World Order, I can shoot deer and eat berries and survive. And uh, I've got a wife who's pretty sturdy. And she'll be able to survive and we'll do what the Indians did uh, before Columbus got here and we'll all survive. The New World Order say, no, we're going to find you. Yeah, well, even in Brave New World, the, they, have a, they had a group of uh, people who still lived as a family and the women breastfed and of course they were called the savages. Yeah. Remember those? Yeah, yeah. We won't have any savages. We'll all be little we'll cultured, we'll be thin, and our teeth will be straight. And something also that was mentioned, uh, forests could and if necessary would be leveled or burned. And this comes out of the, you know, this overall movement about Goddess Mother Earth and how we have to protect the ecology. Oh, yes, the environmental movement, movement. right. But the environmental movement is all expensive. If we want to get a, uh, somebody who's trying to get away, we'll burn down the whole forest, we'll find them. Uh, that was stated. That, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, deforestation would and could be brought about if necessary to be sure that nobody gets outside the uh, control of the system. Well, we're just about uh, drawing to a close here. Um, how did you feel after, um, well, let's see, it's been about, what, 22 years now since yeah. that original lecture, and it probably isn't a day that goes by, at least since I've heard the tapes, that I don't think about the things that this Dr. Day said. It gives constant reminders. Not a day goes by. Something doesn't say, that reminds me of such and such, whether it's uh, surveillance or security, you know, you know, somebody selling security system, you do house for me. But or of, clothing. clothing. Or uh, I opened up a toy catalog uh, the other day, and, and I noticed that there didn't happen to be any baby dolls in the, in the, the toy catalog. Of course, uh, you know, going back to the idea, we don't want little girls to be thinking about babies. They, they only had one little doll, and it was kind of an adult doll, and nothing that would uh, raise anyone's maternal instinct um, for there. Um, well, Doc, what's the, what's the prognosis? Left to man alone. I think the, the technology is already here, um, and with technological progress, <coughs> I think it is inevitable if man is left to some devices that some men will be able to assert total control over other men, over other people. Um, man left to his own devices, it, it, the tendency is in groups like this then for internal dissension to arise where they would the leaders uh, would be at each other's throats too each say no I'm I'm more powerful than you I deserve more than you who will control the controllers yeah they would battle themselves I think uh, so that they, they would create uh, you know the seeds of their own destruction while they're creating the system but the other thing I wonder if in, indeed this uh, may be time for a war to come back and say enough's enough if um, because you're going to destroy my planet Earth, and I am in charge of the planet. I'm in charge of mankind. Mankind will be destroyed or whatever if I say, <clears throat> I'm not allowing my creatures to assume and assert this degree of control where you're going to destroy the whole planet. I was thinking, as you was just saying, that is that um, in past, 
dictators could kill people, they could torture them, but essentially they could not change what it meant to be a human being. They could not change human nature. Yeah. Now we are going to have with this you know, the new genome project, the multi-billion dollar project, where they're going to be getting a tab on everyone's genes. No one shall escape. Everyone shall have their genetic codes uh, and all this. And with this opens the door to, to manipulation to change the very meaning of what it means to be human. Yeah. And one then, if one, if one has an entity then that no longer has free will, um, you just have to wonder, at that point, our Lord says, enough. Just as Lucifer set himself up as God in the beginning, some people now would set themselves up as God and say, I control the computers, I control the genomes, I control them, I am God. And at that, that point, then he would have to say, no, you're not. I have to demonstrate to you, you're not. <laughs> I'm still God. You're just a creature. Yeah. And as you said on the original tape, um, we believe in, in what our Lord has said in the sense that he will not leave us orphans, that, you know, he will be I, with us to the end of time. This right away now begs the question when they come around and say, it's your turn to sign the allegiance form. What are you going to do? When Henry VIII came around and he said, uh, well, you either sign here and join, or, uh, and while he's telling you this, they're throwing the noose over the, <laughs> the limb of the oak tree and uh, saying, uh, slipping the noose around your neck and saying, you want to sign this or do we slap the worst out from any of you? A lot of people said, I won't sign it, and, and they were martyred. Um, despite uh, his having said there will be no martyrs, certainly there will be martyrs. <coughs> and the implication in his statement was, that, well, they will not be recognized as martyrs. But uh, there will be martyrs, and they will be recognized as martyrs. And, uh, maybe uh, not in the same way as in the past, but uh, I think this is something that maybe uh, all people need to sort of prepare themselves for. When I'm nose to nose with this choice, are you going to sign this allegiance or not, or we're going to put you in a box car and you're going out to Arizona in the mm -hmm. desert, people yeah. have to be prepared to make a decision. And I think it would be an understatement uh, not to say, or to say that this really, this, this uh, tape has... Um, great meaning and um, it, uh, it, it's just like a, a, a forewarning and uh, it gives us ideas of things we should do and things we shouldn't do and I think everyone listening to the tape will come up with different things that he can do on a small scale. I think that's the beauty of this thing. It's not, you know, as he was talking, it wasn't like real earth shattering things that he was talking about. He was talking about little things, uh, television, things that we do every day, things that are under our control, mm -hmm. the books we read, uh, you know, and I think uh, probably some of these changes, if they're going to occur, will occur with the individual person within the, that family, that, that um, uh, with, with, you know, him getting the word out and, uh, and then doing the little things. I think they matter over the long haul the most. Just as with the prisoners who survived the brainwashing, I think people who are spiritually oriented, who are thinking about God, thinking about uh, their relationship with God, are the ones who will then be better prepared, very equipped to survive uh, this world and the next. <laughs> uh, whereas those who are just focused on uh, meeting their needs right now, uh, you know, strictly the material needs of the day, uh, they're more easily uh, controlled. Under the threat of losing your comfort or losing your food or losing your head or whatever, uh, you know, certainly some people are going to yield. And those who I think will, will survive, and I, I really mean in both this life and the next, uh, they're going to be the ones who are going to have to be prepared because it's my belief when the time comes to make the decision, you're going to sign on or you're not going to sign on, it's too late to begin in the preparation of. Well, let me think about it. You don't have time to think about it. You're going to either say yes or no. I hope a lot of us make the right decision. <laughs> I do so too, and I think the um, uh, I think the tape will uh, will change as uh, many lives and and have 
hopefully as good an effect as it had had on mine and on yours. So let me thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. For further information, please contact the U.S. Coalition for Life, Box 315, Export, Pennsylvania, 15632. Your comments and criticisms and any other information which you might have regarding this tape will be most welcome.